So he remote views Mars a million years ago. He accurately figures out there's this giant pyramid structure. And then he, the information he obtains gets even weirder. He, he connects with this ancient intelligence that had been there. Basically, that pyramid was like an ark. When he did this, this session in particular, you know, the ship that was going somewhere, uh, which he described, uh, he was asked to get in that ship. And he described it to be a metallic boat-like ship and that they were going to a new place with different vegetation, different kinds of storms, savage storms. Uh, and, and, you know, you put two and two together and it sounds a lot like our planet. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever going to get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. Hey everyone, this is Weaponized. Jeremy, how you doing? Good, George. Good to be back. So today we take a, a, a stroll down a, a, a dark and twisted path into the world of remote viewing. It, it's a topic that, as we know from covering it for a lot of years and getting to know some of the key players in that, that strange phenomena, that it intersects at many points with other intelligences, uh, ancient intelligences, cosmic, alien even, and there are UFO angles to it as well. And and you've got a friend who uh, just produced something that was terrific on the subject of remote viewing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this episode because I, I was w wanting you to see what my buddy Chris Ramsey has done because you've reported on this remote, remote viewing from the beginning. It does tie into UFOs, uh, non-human intelligence, Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, it's it's just wild to me that this is a something that exists, the remote viewing thing, it's been proven that it can be useful, yet it's still so in left field. So you guys, you know, bringing in this, my buddy, Chris Ramsey is going to be so cool. Just to give you a little background, I didn't know shit about Chris Ramsey. Some guy calls me up and said he made a Bob Lazar puzzle. I'm like, what is going on here? Then he shows me some pictures and it's like this $40,000 puzzle. He, he, he solves it over two episodes. I guess he's famous for like doing these puzzles online. It was so cool. And, and so he was like, well, can I come out and just kind of do an interview with you? There's some bonus features, by the way, to, to what he did. And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, anything for Bob and what's going on sounds like a cool project. He comes out, he comes to visit me and he proceeds to blow my mind with close up magic. I mean, it was so, I, I have never seen illusions or tricks close up like this. And he, we're just hanging out. We haven't even really started talking about why he came to visit me yet. And it dawns on me, this guy's like a famous mentalist and magician, like famous. So obviously it's a guy who's dedicated, top of his craft, and he's, he's a sharp dude. So then he shows me this Lazar project. And, it, and again, it, it's so cool. Then he starts telling me about what he's about to release on remote viewing. And he put out this three part series. So the guy's name is Chris Ramsey. He's a, he's a hell of a guy and really excited that, that you guys get to meet today. Cause I want to hear what you guys have to say. Well, I watched his pr a production on remote viewing three parts. It's on his YouTube channel, area 52. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's area 52 investigations. It's a uh, it's terrific work. Kind of have a has a Sam Spade kind of a feel to it, like a, an old time detective office and approach, and uh, you know gaining access to all these guys who were part of both Grill Flame and Stargate. It's hard, you know. It's not an easy nut to crack. But I think Chris worked his way into there and got some really good stuff from a lot of the key players in the history of this phenomena. So let's dive into it. What's up, man? Good to see you. Yeah, man. Stoked to have you on. You know, I'm super impressed by the work that you've done. We'll talk about how we first met after. I think I want to jump right into your work on remote viewing. This is a, a subject that has constantly followed the UFO topic. And you, you just have to look at George Knapp's work to see that uh, it's been intertwined in, in a long way. And this is your first time meeting George, too, right now, right? It is. It's a pleasure to meet you, George. I, Thanks I, for having I me on. I admire your stuff there. I've just been going through uh, the, uh, the projects that you've produced. It's just terrific work. That remote, Thank viewing, you. remote viewing is a very strange path. 
it takes you down some dark alleys, doesn't it? It, it really does. It's uh, I mean, yeah, from from both ends of the spectrum, you know, from from skeptic to believer and everything in between. There's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of really thing a lot of things to consider. Um, and so yeah, it's 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 just food for thought constantly. You know, I, I went into this expecting answers and. And just like anything else, I just end up with more questions. Can I ask so you again, this to start with? I, I recall you seeing there's a line in, in one of your productions where you said you started as a, as a skeptic about psychic abilities. Why don't we start yeah. there? Skeptical why? And, and sure. How uh, I'm a magician. Uh, I've been doing magic for 20 years. And I, I think as a magician, we are very familiar with the charlatans of the past. You know, Houdini was... Uh, one of the first people to try and call out uh, fake psychics and and uh, people mediums and this type of thing, um, you know, even in his passing, his his wife kept doing that. And so I think naturally, as a magician, I'm looking for how things work. I'm looking for methods. That's what we're really um, that's what we're really passionate about is how things work. How can I trick the mind? And when you start stumbling across people who do uh, mentalism. And uh, psychic readings or pseudo psychic readings, uh, we really we've really nailed down how it is that you can convince somebody of psychic ability. And there's it's a really interesting topic. I really love it. And so for most of my career, I've just been very reluctant to listen to any of this stuff because I I'm pretty sure I can fake it. And that was until um, you know until until that series came out and it kind of flipped me on my head a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I like. So, for the audience that, that kind of just catching up here, Chris produced this three part series on his YouTube channel, has a huge YouTube following, does a lot of interesting things. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a, there's a puzzle element to his main channel, but he's also professionally known as, as a magician. So, he, and, and I don't know, you mentalist, illusionist, magician. I mean, just you blew my mind. We'll talk about that later when, when we got to hang out. But when you talk about your series with remote viewing, what was the, the like absolute, like, I have to now figure out if this was true? Is it because you being a magician, you know that a lot of it's mentalism is, is, is a trick or what was it that said, I have to do this? So I would say before, I wouldn't even bat an eye at this stuff because I, I just, I thought I knew, right? So every, anything that came to my ear was, I would just throw it out the window and put it all, put it all with the same bunch of charlatans and all this stuff. And uh, I've always had an interest in this because I think it's really interesting, but I never really bought it. I was very skeptical. And then I read, uh, I read Joe McMonigle's book, uh, Chronicle, uh, Stargate Chronicles, um, The Journey of a Psychic Spy, I think it was called. And, and um, he just came across to me as someone who is very honest, uh, very down to earth and very open. He, you know, he talked about his past and his childhood and everything else. And, and then, you know, this remote viewing stuff really got him into some interesting places for decades and, you know, so after after reading this, obviously, deep diving down into the CIA rabbit hole that is their archives and just started pulling up things and finding really interesting uh, sessions. And so from there, um, a friend of mine who is a national, he's a five time U.S. memory champion, Nelson Dellis. Uh, he got approached on on Facebook through one of his groups by this group who wanted to train him in remote viewing. And he as well, you know, has a background in physics, very skeptical person by nature, but he's like, I'm willing to do this for a good story, at least, and does this and had some incredible results, like one for one, you know, uh, you, you would call these um, uh, first place uh, ratings, basically. That's, you know, kind of CIA had their test. This is like one for one. This image goes with this image. It's it's exactly it. And when he showed me that, you know, I. I I was immediately hooked. I was like, okay, well, this is, there's something, there's something here. And I think that's what a lot of people who look into this stuff end up coming away with, whether, you know, maybe you're not entirely convinced, but you know, for a fact that there is something here and, and there's a reason they studied this for decades. So yeah, once, uh, once he showed me that I started practicing it myself, documented my journey, practicing it and had some really interesting results and yeah. And, and now I'm here. <laughs> You know, the, sure. the general perception among the public is that remote viewing has been debunked. The CIA, put, the, the government put out a report that says it's not reliable, you know, they, and, you know, they did some kind of a test and, and, and looked at the effectiveness. And really, it's not a tool we can use. So that's why it's going away. 
I don't think remote viewing really went away, though. You know, I I don't think so either. And from from what I've heard, you know, uh, it was I think it was a was it a Dateline um, that came out in was it ninety seven? Uh, they did this whole this whole sort of this piece to try and debunk everything when they when they closed out the program, but they kind of lied through omission. Uh, because at one point, uh, I remember them even saying, oh, we would never use remote viewing as a single source of intel. And the fact is that the CIA would never use any single thing as 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 intel. They would always have to have two or three points uh, to make sure something's correct. So it's, you know, there's there's wording in there. And, you know, it was something so cheap uh, like this. I mean, uh, getting such good results over decades. I mean, there's there's no doubt in my mind that they're doing this right now, probably. So, yeah, I want to kind of, again, bring the viewer up to date. So your channel is called Area 52 Investigations. That's a new YouTube channel where you release this three part series. Again, it's exceptional. The visual quality, the storytelling. Uh, let's talk about episode one for a second, because I see your skepticism going into it, your desire, you know, to kind of get to the bottom of this. But you ended up meeting with a guy. I think George probably knows all of these people that you ended up meeting with a guy named Ed Dames. And it was a major Ed Dames. Yep. And you were not, for, not, you know, no, no spoiler here, but as you go in and you look at these people, some people really impressed you. Um, but, but that first episode, it was, it was a, a gray area with, with major Ed Dames. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say. I, I read his book and, you know, a lot of really bold claims in that book and through Nelson. Nelson was actually taught by uh, Brett Stewart, who is in turn taught by uh, Ed Dame. So we had, you know, a through line to Ed there. And uh, I thought, well, this this is my way in uh, to start talking to some of these people who work for Project Stargate. And, you know, Ed claims a lot of things. Um, and, and the one thing that I found out, and this is generally for all remote viewers who are involved with the project, is you got to take everything they say with a grain of salt. And I think for multiple reasons, again, being a magician, you know, uh, memory uh, and time and, and all of these things can be a little convoluted and, and conflated in someone's head. So, yeah, there was some there was some really interesting things. Obviously, there was nothing we could verify. And that ultimately was what kind of pushed me further to say, OK, let's go to the next guy, uh, because if you can't verify anything, then anyone can say anything. Right. And that's. Uh, Ed Dames has at. made a lot of controversial claims. I, I remember uh, one that he made about when and where the alien invasion would begin. That mm -hmm. that did not exactly turn out to, to be true. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that there are some folks in the remote viewing world who do not hold him in high esteem for his abilities. But there are some people whose abilities you learn to respect. Can you maybe walk us through, for our listeners who aren't familiar with the history of the program, Grill Flame, Project Stargate, CIA, U.S. Army, how all that fit, fit together? Yeah, um, I mean, so in the in the 70s, the CIA or uh, I guess the CIA, but some other agencies received some intel that the Russians were currently working on this remote viewing project and researching all the size stuff. So all the ESP related mind reading, psychokinesis and all this and you know, the U.S. wanted to have an edge. They didn't want to be left behind, naturally so, right? Even if something is really crazy, uh, we might throw a couple million dollars into it and just see if we can, you know, pull something from it. Uh, they did this uh, at first, and they yielded some really interesting results, enough for them to continue. Uh, but there's, it was a dicey time in history, and Grill Flame had to be shut down for... Uh, for numerous reasons, and this is something I'm sure you're familiar with too, is that as soon as someone catches wind of a project, they end up closing it down, firing everyone, and then reopening it uh, under a different name. You know, and that's why this a project like this has like a dozen names because, again, you know, things come up and they just have to bury it and restart it and open it again. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't until uh, they introduced uh, Stanford Research Institute into this that I really was interested because now we're looking at science. Um, you know, at SRI, they had, they had made a team of, I believe it was 12, uh, a scientific oversight committee of 12 scientists. And these were the nation's most uh, well-known scientists. Some, you know, some of them a little controversial in themselves, 
uh, but but Nobel Prize winning scientists uh, who had to be skeptical of the project in order to study it and had to look at it from a scientific perspective. Now, through this and through the help of uh, Dr. Ed May and uh, Joseph McGon- McMonigal, uh, they were able to to really create a database of all of this stuff. Um, you know, the the one part about this that is a little bit uh, hard, hard to even like come up with. How do I say this? Uh, like evidence, because a lot of these projects are still classified. A lot of these operations were classified, even though they declassified the name of the project and some things, you know, 99% of these projects haven't seen the light of day. And most of the projects that the remote viewers were a part of, they didn't even know about these projects. They didn't have any clue, you know, and and so it, it was really hard figuring out correct uh timelines who said what in the archives because there's no names and everything but as soon as i got introduced to uh joseph mcmonagall and uh, dr ed may i think it really became clear to me how important this was for the united states especially because they had over 500 uh returning uh, 500 new missions with sri and Project Stargate. So that's 500 individual missions that 17 of the 19 agencies in the government went to SRI to, uh, you know, to to get some information on. Can you now, share with us some biographical data about the, the the two guys who were like a building blocks of the remote viewing, the protocols and techniques? Ingo Swan, of course, and then later yep. Uri Geller. You had Ingo Swan, you had Uri Geller, you know, and... Uh, during that time, also, obviously, you had uh, Dr. Hal Putoff and, uh, you know, Pat Price uh, uh, were really big names in there. Um, but Ingo Swan and um, and Yuri Geller were known as natural psychics. Uh, so these people weren't trained by the government as they did later. They trained a whole bunch of people in the army and so on and so forth. But at first, they were on the lookout. They kind of uh, they they just looked all over the world for psychics, for natural psychics, what we would consider natural psychics. Uh, they found Ingo Swan. And I mean, Ingo Swan is still to this day, I think by every side of the remote viewing spectrum, whether you agree with that dames or not, or all this stuff, we can all agree that Ingo Swan, he is, he's the goat when it came to this stuff, right? Every, everyone knew that. Uh, Yuri Geller, on the other hand, is uh, is a bit of a dicey character. Um, like myself, he's a magician. Um, but for years, he claimed that his powers were real. Uh, and the whole magic community, you know, we obviously know that, you know, bending spoons isn't something you can actually do. It's, you know, it requires sleight of hand and misdirection and all this stuff. And uh, but I've spoken to Yuri and as much as. I wanted to give him a little bit of a voice in all this, because as much as I know that there's a side of entertainment to him, he also has some really interesting work in remote viewing and was approached by the government multiple times uh, on and uh, read into secret projects involving uh, nuclear arms and and Russia and all this stuff. So, um, you know, when those guys got brought in, it uh, it did create a little bit of a little bit of a hysteria around that. And I think that's the reason why Ingo, or sorry, Yuri Geller was kind of shut out of the project, a little bit too much light on him. And then they proceeded with, uh, with getting, you know, they, they had 600, I think 600 people that they, uh, that they tested ranging from uh, people working at Stanford, uh, scientists, uh, Mensa candidates, uh, so all a range of people. And they found that like 1% of those people had these abilities and you know some of them were the military and you know some of them were from elsewhere but uh that's really how it sort of got down and when you think about it one percent doesn't sound like a lot but of one percent of everybody that's a lot of people who can you know who can supposedly have these abilities so i'm curious the what made me kind of sit back as you told this story so well is and really impressed you joe mcmonagle uh, this is a guy that was, I think, number, labeled as number one in the Army's remote viewing program. He's like the first guy they, they brought in. The detail 
with which he would draw topography, landscapes, buildings. It was, it was, it was very surreal when they ended up comparing them. And he had some very provable moments that what he was doing was actual. He would go on Japanese television, did a couple of different things where he like would find people and nobody thought that, that he was going to be able to do this. And it was to the T exactly what he found. You illuminated a lot of that in, in your, in your special or your three part series. But I mean, that's what really grabbed me, man, was the detail with which he could draw these buildings and landscapes. I mean, it's proof positive that somehow this ability exists to collect data from outside of traditional means. Right. Is that why you were ended up being real impressed with it or? Yeah, I had no idea. Um, you know, everything that I've learned in, uh, I studied it for about a year and everything that I've done uh, was sort of generalizations. You could, you could say they weren't one for one matches, but they were pretty close. Like I would, you know, if it was a volcano, I'd have this sort of cliff-like structure and I'd have words like a uh, sulfuric and, 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 and uh, you know, hot and all of these adjectives to describe the volcano, but you wouldn't really see that it's a volcano on the picture. Then Joe McMonagall, I start looking into his work, and this guy not only is he you know a, a, a well trained psychic, he's also an artist. Uh, he's he's incredible at drawing, and man, that just I, I didn't know that something like that was possible until I saw his work. Like if you look at the sessions that we had, you know, there's scribbles everywhere. There's stuff like okay, maybe not this, maybe this, and there's none of that on his. So when we when we saw his drawings. Um, of his sessions and, and all the words he used and nothing was crossed out and nothing was wrong. Like that just blew my mind. I thought, you know, I had this stream of consciousness, I guess, coming in and I was, you know, vividly try, or trying to, trying to see a little bit of what I could. And he would just, just draw these buildings and these places. And like you said, topography, he had street maps and subway exits and, and all of this stuff. I mean, I have, uh, I have something here. This is, uh, oh yeah, here's, here's something he was hired to find. Um, he had to track this agent from this agency that we don't know uh, th in three different locations. And once he did that successfully, he had to tell them what he was working on. And this, this is sort of like a, radio, uh, or a microwave uh, emitter, a radio wave emitter. And this is what he drew. And you, I mean, even the coils going around, and everything, even the the radius of the beams going out, and I've just never seen anything so technical in my life. Like this was absolutely mind boggling. It was double blind. So, so, so you didn't the, know for the what audience, the target was. For the audience that's just listening right now, Chris is holding up an image that is of what the remote viewer Joseph McMonagall drew without knowing anything. It's like what they call a double blind experiment. Basically, he is given a set of data points, uh, and he was told those data points. But that's it. I mean, meaning um, you're, you're looking at a uh, GPS, right? So you're looking at basic longitude latitudes. Yeah. Uh I believe so. If if not, it would have been just a series of numbers. Okay. And the numbers are only to attach to uh, whatever it is they're trying to look for, the target. So there's no actual meaning behind the numbers sometimes. Right. And yeah. And, and from that, and double blind, meaning that uh, his monitor, so the person being his monitor, I believe might have been Dr. May at this time. Um, neither one of them knows what's going on. Neither one of them has any idea who it is, if it's even, uh, if it's anything, they don't know. This could be in a different country entirely or a different planet. Uh, yeah. He can look into a secure facility, see exactly where a person is, describe the guy's office and what they're currently working on and what their hobby of, which is, will be revealed in your show, what their hobby mm -hmm. is on that uh, test facility. I mean, it's like a real problem when it comes to national security and these eyeballs yep. getting in somehow to these secure facilities. That was another thing that was raised from this work yeah it scared the crap out of him uh and that that's uh that's his words not mine uh he 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 really said it, it really uh shook them to the core to, uh, to know i think that something like this was even possible under you know under national security under under the highest levels of security they were still able to show what they were working on targets that are so accurate so i i think it's 
I, I mean, I would agree that it is scary. You know, if, if uh, you know, if Russia's doing this, if China's doing this, like, how do you protect yourself from that? <laughs> You know, Ingo Swan had developed these protocols for remote viewing, sort of a, a way, a step-by-step -step process to teach and help other psychics expand their consciousness and extend it out in the universe or cosmos and, and get information. Joe McMonigle sort of took that and uh, another step because of these out-of-body experiences he kept having. So his abilities as a remote viewer went far beyond what the normal RV person would be because he did it out-of-body, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he was brought to the Monroe Institute uh, on weekends, I believe, for 14 months uh, during his time at uh, SRI uh, and, you know, working for working for these agencies on the weekends. He would spend them at the Monroe Institute. So he's working seven days a week at this point. And for 14 hours a day in the weekend, they would put him in these pods and, um, you know, out of body experiences, again, this is all these things are all adjacent. They're all sort of connected somehow. And they were doing a lot of studies about outer body and astral projection. And so they would get him into this sort of state, this uh, um, what do you what do you call this state when you're when you're in like a dream um, yeah, like a dream state, uh, they would get him into this, put ping pong balls on his eyes and shine red light and then have, uh, you know, have some frequency played in his ear. And then after a while, you wouldn't see red, you would see black and you wouldn't hear anything. And that's just our ability to recognize change. Right. And if there's no change, then we hear and see nothing. And once you're in that state, that's what they consider this, this sort of uh, lucid state. And so from there, they were able to do a lot of really interesting things. And on one occasion, I think they had the DOD come in and uh, with Bob Monroe, who was there, and Joe McMonagall was laying down in the pod, I think recuperating from one of his sessions. And Bob Monroe was handed an envelope with coordinates. And um, the coordinates were on the outside of the envelope, but on the inside of the envelope, he had no idea what was there. Neither did Joe. No one knew. It was a target. And much like most targets, they're double blind and they'll never know what's in the envelope. Gives him the envelope and gives the coordinates to Joe. And all of a sudden, Joe starts, he starts describing what seems to be Mars a million years ago. Uh, I mean, giant megalithic pyramids and, and all sorts, and, and people that are 12 foot tall and I mean, I, I think I even have that here. And so for your listeners, uh, there's there's a couple pictures here that he describes, but you can see this giant humanoid uh, figure standing next to someone. And then he has these pyramidal structures. And now, Be hold on, before know, you go on with this, this is mm -hmm. driving me crazy. So this is the third part in your series. So if anybody goes to your YouTube channel, Area 52 Investigations, this is part three. And this just blew my mind. You, you teach us in part two all about the Stargate program, all these different players, how the CIA was involved from Yuri Geller, Kit Green, um, Hal put off like all these people. And then you're like, so we've determined Joe McMonagall can remote view stuff. This is weird, mm -hmm. but we've determined it. Well, by the way, in part three, you're starting to describe he's remote viewing a contact, like some coordinates. He doesn't know where this is, but what he describes, he's supposed to go, you know, a million years back. It turns out it's on Mars on another planet. Yeah. So continue explaining this, but understand when we're watching your show, it's like we're paying attention now because of what he's gotten right. So what did That's he right. see when he went to Mars remote viewing over a million years ago? I mean, so uh, and, and again, like he had no idea that this was in the envelope. Afterwards, he did see that the envelope said uh, target was Mars one million years B.C. And he doesn't like these sort of he doesn't like doing these woo woo targets too much. Because they're unverifiables. You can't verify anything. And, and I'm sure today we probably could, but a whole other story. Um, so he's in there and he's saying things like, man, the sun looks weird and there are these people and, and they're waiting for this craft. And, you know, they're jumping him to different locations. They're giving him different coordinates or Bob Monroe's giving him uh, the different coordinates. And he's just going, he's very confused at this point and just keeps talking about how there's these giant, like, really, really big pyramids. And, like, 
you could fit three of the pyramids in Giza into this pyramid. He's like, is this a new discovery? Very, very confused at this point. And, uh, you know, that file, by the way, is currently available. If anybody wants to look it up, um, they are available at the, uh, the National Archive and the CIA Archive. And so you, you guys can go look at that yourself. And there's the whole transcript of, of that session. Where he's remote so, Mars a million years ago and sees megalithic structures and beings yeah. with some sort of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence that's telling him about how they're having to hibernate and wait because their planet was ripped open by a passing asteroid. I mean, it's it's wild. It is wild. And, you know, it, it, it's wild coming from someone who, you know, who has these credentials and has this credibility. And so he even thought it was wild himself. And so what he did... Uh, he went to uh, J, uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, because he was told that uh, he could get photos of Mars from there. So he took the coordinates, you know, being a spy, he's remembering all this information. He's a smart guy. He heads down to JPL and, and gives them the coordinates he was given. And, and he says, can I have pictures of these? And the guy at JPL says to him, oh, you mean the city on Mars? Jokingly. And he goes, What? opens a drawer, slaps down a bunch of pictures of the exact coordinates he's looking for, and lo and behold, they match exactly what he was looking at, including this pyramid, which might have been 2,000 feet tall or uh, beside a crater, which would have been blown away by any impact, by the way. And, um, you know, and he's even asking the guy, he's like, what is this? And the guy goes, I, I must have grown there. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah, there was this, just, George, never there got was a straight this, answer. Uh, there was a, he goes right around the face on Mars, right? He's going through all these different structures and he's right. Like what you remember, he just had coordinates. But one of the things that he saw was there was an impact crater when he went to JPL. That impact crater is a you know, perfect circle. But on the edge of that crater, you can tell from the shadows is something that is thousands and thousands and thousands of feet tall. I mean, it's it's a huge structure, but it's on the edge of that crater. If that crater, so, so it had to be put there after whatever hit the, the you know the, the surface of Mars, it would have obliterated that structure next to it. So he sees that as proof positive that they built something on the edge of that crater. It's pretty wild. It, it's yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, I would say unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it's really you know, hard to the believe. of disbelief now. You know the guy yeah. could nail it. That's and that was the most concerning thing for me is like, you know, uh, opening the door to remote viewing. All this, all this, it's not a door. It's a floodgate, you know, and it just starts pouring in. And that's uh, yeah, it's something I'm still dealing with. So he remote views Mars a million years ago. He accurately figures out there's this giant pyramid structure. And then it, the information he obtains gets even weirder. He he connects with this ancient intelligence that had been there. Basically, that pyramid was like an arc. They had put themselves yeah. in there in sort of suspended animation, hibernation, in order to someday be revived and, and perhaps survive. But it was very, it's a very sad story, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, you know, and he, he even said that, like, once he was inside these pyramids, and you're right, he did describe them to be, uh, to have these sort of hibernation chambers, and they were, uh, they, there was no furniture or anything. It wasn't for living. It was strictly for hibernating. And when he was asked to talk to one of these beings through his consciousness in this meditative state that he was in, um, it responded to him and it kind of uh, it kind of explained to him, you know, that they were just waiting and hoping uh, that someone that the party that left in this ship would come back uh, and, and pick them up. And it, it, it was very, uh, very sad for him. Uh, even when he recounts it, he, he felt their pain. And he says he doesn't believe that he spoke to anyone in particular. He believes that whatever this was, was some sort of artificial intelligence that you could question and it would give you answers. And I, you know, immediately I'm, you know, a fan of superheroes. You think of, uh, you think of Superman going into, you know, his crystal cave and he's got these crystals with like this information in it. Right. And that's immediately where my mind jumped to. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if we had, artificial intelligence and 
you know, millions of years go by, like, of course, there would be some type of beacon that people, you know, might be able to communicate with. It it sounded like a holographic technology that was presenting what happened on that planet, kind of like a time capsule. And he was able to interact with this time capsule of like what happened. He also said something really fascinating. And look, this all leads back to UFOs and aliens. And so I want to to talk about that tie over here because there was an experience before he was a remote viewer in this program, which really um, is something that I've heard from a lot of people that have these types of abilities. Even Yuri Geller, you know, claimed or claims at one time that that he had a UFO experience. But what what Joseph McMonagle said that just kind of blew me away, he goes, and George has talked to me a lot about this, is that he says, we are the aliens, maybe descendants of the Martians, that there was an intelligence that was probably here on Earth far longer than humankind. And that's what we are experiencing as UFOs. Do you remember when he was telling you about that, Chris? Yeah. Um, I mean, he that's his belief, because when he did this this session in particular, you know, the ship that was going somewhere, uh, which he described, uh, he was asked to get in that ship and he described it to be a metallic boat like ship and that they were going to a new place with different vegetation, different kinds of storms, savage storms. Uh, and, and, you know, you put two and two together and it sounds a lot like our planet, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I mean, just hearing something like that. And obviously this can't be you know, verified by myself at this current time. But I mean, what a great theory to, to, you know, and for someone, for someone who's so disconnected from that stuff and and doesn't really fall into it on his daily life, he's not out there doing, you know, talking about UFOs and this, he's just living his life. And he's like, well, this is what I saw. He's just telling us what he perceived. And I thought that was really just so interesting that, uh, that that might have been our origin story. Well, he says it. He says the Martians are us, right? That's his. Yep. That's his. That's what he says. Yeah. You know the uh, Ingo Swan remote viewed UFOs. I think mm. uh, they gave him that assignment. I know that McMonagall says in your documentary he doesn't like doing that stuff because basically you can never completely verify that it's real. But he he ran into him. I had heard the same thing from the Russian psychics that uh, they're remote viewers. They would project their consciousness out and kept coming into contact with some sort of a cosmic intelligence, they called it, alien intelligence. It sort of comes with the territory. Wow. I mean, is that <laughs> with you? But I mean, did you talk to a lot of remote viewers who have had contact with something else, whether they intended that or not? Um, not not so much. I've only heard uh, from the documentaries that I've seen. And, you know, re- uh, uh, there was Mind Trek, uh, Joseph McMonagall's other book, uh, which was you know, goes into a lot of that stuff as well. Um, it's, it's just, you know, when it, when it comes to that stuff, it's, it's so difficult for me to, 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 to really immerse myself into it unless I experience it myself. And I think that's what keeps me going. Well, you know, why I am so interested in the UFO subject and the remote viewing subject. Cause I want that. I want to feel that I want to come in contact with, you know, some type of alien species. Wouldn't that be awesome? Right. And so uh, I'm fascinated by everybody's story. And I do. I do. But, you know, it's one of those things where I I need to I need to feel it. I need to see it. You know, tell us a little bit about, though, Joseph McMonagall's uh, UFO experience. because I'd never heard it before. But, you know, when he relayed that story to you, just tell us what happened before he was a remote viewer. Yeah, he uh, he was working in the Bahamas, I believe, or in Bermuda. Might have been Bermuda. And he was he was a diver out there, and they were um, they were shipped out there for I believe six months. Posted out there for like six months, and him and a friend after duty went to go see a few movies at this. Uh, they had this like drive-in theater, and uh, after that, had a bunch of beer and decided to walk home but they decided to take a cut through a shortcut through like these sand dunes and as they get to the top of one of the dunes the place like you know lights up like it's high noon and they look up and there's this cone of light beaming on them and this spherical disc shape sort of object uh, and they can see panel lines and everything and this thing is just rotating hovering over them you know in this moment they're frozen in shock. And just as they can like adjust their eyes to it, it's gone. It's, you know, he said it might've taken off or even folded in space time because 
there's no way that something could uh, could take off that fast. Now, that doesn't make this story interesting. That's obviously a great story. Um, but what makes this really interesting is that they went to go grab some beers after that, obviously, because they had a process <laughs> with the health. And they made a pact. They're like, we're not going to tell anybody about this. Like this, we we like it here. We don't want to get posted to Vietnam. We you know we kind of want to hang out here. The next day, he's feeling ill, but he's all right. He heads uh, over to see his buddy, Stephen, who was there with him. And his door's open. He's not there. He asks the guy across the hall. He's like, what happened to him? They said, they, yeah, they, he got medevac out. They took him down to uh, Homestead, uh, the hospital in Homestead. They had to fly him out. He was feeling tremendously sick. And he's like, huh, I better go get checked out. So he goes to the doctor the, the naval uh, doctor that was there. And he tells the doctor, he's like, all right, well, here's what really happens, right? Because he wants to get to the bottom of this. He's kind of scared. And the doctor just starts ripping up his own, uh, ripping up his papers and throws them out. And he says, don't ever talk about that again. Prescribes him some iodine pills. Take these for two weeks. It's possible that you have radiation poisoning. Now, and Joseph said, I don't know what that was about, but the pills made me feel better. Um, so he took those, uh, pills, did feel better, ends up seeing his buddy and his buddy, you know, he says, you know, that was, that was a crazy, that was a crazy thing that happened. He's like, yeah, I got burned pretty badly. He's like, yeah, you did. And he opens up his shirt and you see the imprint of his shirt sort of, uh, charred on his chest, like burnt on his chest, like a bad sunburn. Um, which reminds me of some other UFO story that happened in Canada, by the way, where there was a similar encounter. Um, and he says, well, you know, that run me through, you know, what you think happened. And he's like, oh, I was fixing the radiator of a red truck. And he goes, and he goes, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, the red truck. And it, it burnt me pretty badly. And he goes, what red truck are you talking about? There's no, there are no red trucks on this entire base. They're white trucks and blue trucks. There's no red. And he's like, I don't know. It was a red truck. <laughs> and he's like, well, okay, well, tell me about the movies we saw. And he goes, what movies? <laughs> How about the bar? He goes, what bar? He couldn't remember anything before or after. And all to this day, he even saw him like 20 years later to this day, red truck. That's so a, I, yeah. you know, make, make of that what you will. But yeah. That's a men in black shit right there, man. <laughs> that sounds like it. it did, here's something I didn't include in the, in the, uh, in the documentary. He did tell me about a run in with a men in black. Oh, or what he perceives uh, to be the men in black. Uh, and this was over dinner. And I thought this was just the most fascinating story I've ever heard. So he's given a target him and his monitor. So when you're remote viewing, you're by yourself in this room, you know, this gray room, and you're by yourself and you have your monitor, you're given an envelope by a third party. So both of you, neither of you know what's in the envelope. What was in the envelope were three pictures and he finds this out later, but were three pictures uh, from taken from an airplane of a UFO of a, and there, there are panel lines. It's kind of, it's kind of like oval shaped with like panel lines and rivets and, and that type of thing. And, and it is flying at about 14,000 feet at about 3,000 miles an hour and doing like right angle turns and they got like these pictures of it. So unbeknownst to him, he's drawing. Now he's drawing the landscape that he sees outside of this airplane very accurately, right? And then all of a sudden he goes like this. And his monitor goes, what was that? And he goes, I don't know, something just crossed my line of sight really fast. And he says, can you draw it? And he goes, yeah. And he ends up drawing this UFO and they both look at it and they go, huh? They put it, neither of them said it was a UFO, by the way. They're just like, this is interesting. And he even wrote down 13,900 feet and like 3,200 miles an hour beside it. Right. And they, they put it aside and they're like, maybe this is nothing. Let's just keep going with the target. All of a sudden they get a knock on the window. There's a, there's, you know, the two sided, two sided mirror and uh, the monitor fuming because you're not supposed to interrupt these things at all. Fuming, gets up, pushes back, walks in. He, he hears yelling now, and all of a sudden the yelling stops for about a minute. His monitor comes back in, sits down and goes, please tell me more about this object. <laughs> and so he, he draws the whole object, everything goes on. Now, um, the next day he gets a call from the Pentagon. And they're like, we want we want a meeting in the broom closet. So I guess this is a place in the Pentagon that is like, 
you know, under some stairwell. Skiff I don't know. Or something. Yeah. yeah, skiff. Exactly. And so he goes into he goes into this place. Now, uh, as he as he as he walks in, there's these two men, black, black suits, no, no name tags, no affiliation to anything. And they have this tube. They pull out these papers, uh, these pictures, and they lay them down. It's the target. And the first thing Joe says, he goes, holy shit, it is a UFO. Oh. And they and they go, as far as you're concerned, that's a weather balloon. And he goes, nope. And they slide him an NDA, and he's like, I'm not signing that. He's like, I'm not signing. I'm not that. That's a UFO. I know what I'm looking at. They roll it up, infuriated, and they say, "You know, we're going to speak to your, uh, we're going to speak to your colonel or whatever it is. Uh, let's get out of here." They leave, super mad. Next day, he gets a call from the Pentagon again. Same thing. We require you to be in this room. So he now this time, um, this is uh, this is this is he. You know, obviously he's a he's a spy, right? So he gets a call. He takes he takes down uh, the numbers of the pictures he was shown. So these these pictures have coordinates on them, right? He takes he remembers all this. He heads over to the I think the naval intelligence, and says, "I request these pictures. Can you please uh, give me these pictures?" Never gets an answer, and so then he gets the call, goes to the Pentagon. Now he's a little bit nervous. He's like, "Okay, what can I do?" He brings handcuffs with him. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. These guys, they're not, they've got no badges or anything. What authority do they have over me? He's like, he's pumping himself up and he's saying to himself, I'm, he's like, if you want to know who someone works for, arrest them and wait to see who comes and picks them up. <laughs> right? So he's sitting in there and he's pumping his fists. He's by himself in this room. And he's like, if there's two guys, I'm going to take one guy down and I'm going to, you know, handcuff the other. And he's really into this and he's, he, his adrenaline's going, door walks, door swings open. And it's two naval intelligence officers. And he goes, oh, shit. Right? Oh, no. This is this is no good. And they're decorated and everything else. And they look at him and they go, how come you asked for the only three pictures we're missing? Oh, wow. That's amazing. And so on his feet, he, he couldn't uh, blow his cover, obviously. Uh, you couldn't be like, well, I did a remote viewing thing, right? So he turns it on them and starts yelling at them. How come you lost my pictures? This and that. And they ended up, they ended up just like leaving, and, and you know, because uh, he's like, I'm gonna, uh, you know, these are my pictures. You're supposed to protect them. And uh, so quick thinking on his feet, yeah. And they got out of there. But uh, you know, that goes to show you, you know, that uh, there there are places and agencies in the government that don't even know everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I recall. Uh, speaking with Hal put off a few times about the remote viewing program. Uh, you know, as I recall, they, the CIA or had two uh, experts brought in to evaluate the program when they needed an excuse to pretend they were canceling it. They write some report uh, based on the available information. Yeah, you can't rely on this remote viewing stuff. We suggest, you, you know, you get rid of it. Hal says 99%, 95% of all the good stuff has never been made available to them or the public or anyone. It's still classified, right? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, you know, that's that's part of the frustration with all this too, because you know, even the government when they declassify things, you know, they can declassify whatever they want. And they can just just bury anything else. And uh, you know, Joe even told me too. He's like, a lot of that stuff, you'll it'll just never see the light of day. Um, you know, whether. All the missions, they had, you know, 505 missions spanned over these uh, two decades. You know, none of those missions are public or what those missions actually accomplished. We know the agencies, you know, that wanted uh, information and intel from these remote viewers, uh, you know, even the DIA, I think between the DIA and the Joint Task Force, I think there was over like 200 missions between those two. That came back for new missions, um, you know, but all those missions, yeah, to, to this day are are still buried somewhere, um, you know, and that's that, that it's it's what makes it it's what makes it fun for someone like me who gets to dig and ask questions. But it's also very frustrating when you hit a wall when you're just like, I just I just want to know, you know, what you guys what you guys did. <laughs> did you yeah. have a hard time getting access to these folks? Um, 
at at first, it, uh, you know, I I played I played the YouTube card. Uh, I'll be honest, you know, I got a lot of subscribers, and then you know, some people don't care about that. It was fair game, uh, but you know, it's it's just like any other credible source. I think if you can if you can back it up with a little bit of a uh, bit of history and, 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 you know, maybe show them how passionate you are about something and then maybe they'll open up a little bit more. And, um, you know, Joe, Joseph was, uh, is not someone who gives out interviews very easily. Right. And, um, when I contacted him, um, and I spoke to him over the phone, he was nothing but friendly, nothing but kind. And his wife, Scooter as well. Um, uh, you know, they, they were just the most receptive, uh, honest and caring people, and from then, you know, I, I got to meet Dr. May as well. And, and so I think once I had my foot in the door, I was uh, I was a little bit OK. But yeah. Yeah. I hope Joe McMonagle's OK. You heard different things about him. Uh, none of us are getting any younger. But I, I hope. He's yeah. Okay. He, he by the way, he, he remote viewed Skinwalker Ranch during the Bigelow era. Um, really? Yeah, he did. You should ask him about that if you're still in touch with him. I am still in touch with them, and I will ask him about that. That's a whole other fascinating subject I love to get into. And, man, it just shows you how connected all of this is. And, you know, when you look at when you look at the top UFO researchers in the world are also ex-members of Project Stargate, and, you know, everything just – you can't help but jump to conclusions. Um, so are you done with remote viewing, or you think you might take another stab at it? Um, I wouldn't say – I wouldn't say done. I, I would say I, I'm still actively uh, researching, but uh, until something new comes to light, uh, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I, I think I've created a good baseline for a lot of people who wanted to get into this category and wanted to know more about it. And that's all I really wanted to do. I wanted to educate people on something and just have them open their minds a little bit more. Because what the mainstream media tells you on Dateline, you know, you, you can't just take that and, and just close the book on everything, especially when there's data spanning 20 plus years, you know, uh, but people sometimes, you know, don't have the courage or, you know, they, they just don't don't know where to look. And so for me, it was really important in presenting all that data information from credible sources uh, to people. And, you know, hopefully with my reach. Uh, I'm able to just get people a little bit more interested in asking the right questions and, 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 and not being so easily convinced by the answers they're given. Coming up on Area 52 Investigations. My name is Joseph McMonagle. I was the first one recruited for the uh, Stargate program. So they assigned me 001. But his drawings were so precise and detailed, with maps. There's 16 apartments, she's in the third floor. Get out of your body, open the envelope, and study the photograph that's in that envelope, and you tell us what you saw. Because what was in the envelope was this. Yeah, that's the right response. And it was a, a pyramid, really huge pyramid, in comparison to the big pyramid in Egypt. You could put three of them inside this. I want to know if the government's still doing this. Here are the 19 agencies, and the numbers on top of these bar graphs are the number of times, independent chimes, with different new missions, that each of these places came back with new missions. Ah, yes! <laughs> this one. So that raises two questions. What the hell opens that door in your head, mm. and what closes the door? They took me to the Lawrence Livermore Radiation Labs, to see if my mind can trigger a nuclear bomb. Well, that three-part presentation on your YouTube channel is terrific. Um, what else you're working on and what else is on that site that our, our listeners might be interested in? Um, so right now we're, I mean, we have a podcast as well on there, which it's called Debrief. So we kind of go through the whole project. Uh, and right now I'm working on several investigations, if you want to call it that. But uh, uh, one of them in particular is um, the work of Dr. Michael Newton and uh, Journey of Souls, The Life Between Life. Um, I just I just thought this was endlessly fascinating. I read a book about this uh, this hypnotherapist who somehow stumbled into, he, he did regression therapy, reluctantly did past life regression, very skeptical person. 
and ended up fixing a problem with the patient. So he said, okay, I'm going to further examine this. And then, yeah, one day by accident, uh, ended up between lives with one of his patients. And since then, has recorded over 7,000 sessions with 7,000 different people of life between life. And these people from all around the world, and they're saying the same things. They are describing the same things, the same journey, the same areas. They're like mapping it out. And so I've contacted the Michael Newton Institute and speaking with the director uh, and I'm trying to set up a session for myself and, and go deeper into this subject. Because I think, again, I think this ties into everything. I think there's a through line here somewhere if we look hard enough. That, that's what I really appreciate about your work, man. I mean, it's, it's gripping visually. It's highly recommended so people can go see it. But you immerse yourself in what you're doing. You know, you learned remote viewing and practiced it over time to see for yourself if there's something to it. And you had some really surprising results that you do show in your series from your own experience. So I, I appreciate the way I think George and I are like that, too. It's you put your feet on the ground and you start looking at things from a personal perspective as well. But I want to talk a little bit about our first chapter as friends, you reach out to me, you tell me that you're doing something, a Bob Lazar puzzle. That's like, what is he talking about? Who's this guy, Chris, with a Bob Lazar puzzle? You know what I mean? Sounds cool, man. Just tell me what you got. He ended up showing me, he had this massive, complex puzzle made, you know, for however many tens of thousands of dollars you replicated the hand scanner that Lazar had to use when he was working out at site for the badge. I mean, it was just so, there's no way to describe it. People got to go see it. That's on your primary YouTube channel, Chris Ramsey. But wow, it's a two-part series. And I know George has looked at it with me a little bit too and, and seeing what you did, but your history as a, a magician and mentalist and then doing these puzzles that became so famous online, people know you for, to do that about UFOs. I mean, what, in, what gave you the saucer Lazar fever to make that puzzle, man? That's a big commitment. Bob Lazar's ID badge at S4. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I mean, I've been a fan of Lazar's history uh, since I, I first saw George Knapp's coverage of it. And I, I don't believe I saw it when it came out. I think it was too young for that. Uh, but I, I, I do think it was uh, early 2000s. Could have been like 2000. For 2005, maybe it was that's I, I remember being into Bob Lazar stuff for the past like 15 years. Like it's it's taken over a good part of my life. Just I, and I think it's what really um, catapulted me into this whole realm. You know, I've been a fan of Unsolved Mysteries and all these things since I was a kid. But uh, but Bob's story really stood out to me. And I even have like this is the, the, the signed sort of. Uh, <laughs> The signed Bob Lazar poster here that nice. I purchased from uh, his website. I mean, I was a big, big fan of a uh, big fan of the whole universe. And I wanted to combine a few things. I wanted to combine the puzzle solving process with my audience, but I wanted to make it about something that I was equally as passionate about. And that's, uh, and that's Bob's story. And, um, you know, for me, on my main channel, just making a documentary or, or talking about Bob Lazar wouldn't fit so well with my audience just because it would, it would be left field a little bit. And so I, I was looking for a way to integrate Bob's story. And, you know, uh, so I had this puzzle commissioned by a company in France called Labsterium. Uh, they worked on it for about a year. Um, and, you know, it's a massive puzzle. I think a total of $40,000 and, and, uh, you know, it, it's it's loosely based on Bob's story. I would I yeah. wouldn't say it's uh, I wouldn't say it's anything. You know, uh, go to your own research on on Bob's stuff. Watch, you know, Jeremy's documentary or, or George's work. But uh, but this is more to um, in in an entertaining fashion, sort of illuminate people to uh, the things Bob was saying and the, the things that Bob's been through. And so uh, I wanted I wanted to kind of hit two birds with one stone. And at the same time, it would set up my new channel and this new journey I was on. So super fun, dude. Thank I mean, you. really cool. He's got some, Chris has some really like secret stuff. So if you really watch that video closely, the, Chris and I spent some time together and man, he's got some real secrets in there. If you keep your eyes open towards the end, right, Chris? Definitely. Easter eggs. Yeah, there, there are some Easter eggs. There are some, uh, there is some hidden things. 
bit of an ARG uh, for you to discover. Um, but if you're left at the end of the second part of, it's a two part solve, which I've never done before. Uh, but at the end of the second part, if you're left feeling a little unfulfilled, well, it's because it isn't over. Oh, no. <laughs> really cool, man. Hey, well, I just thank you so much. I'm glad. I'm really stoked to have you and George, you know, together because George has been covering the remote viewing before anybody. It seems like every sentence ends with that with George's work. They're doing a special. They're, they're releasing on, on his journalism right now, but he knows all these people you're talking about has been down this, you know, and reported on this for a long time. There's something really powerful there. And it appears to relate to all these other phenomena that we like to talk about from Skinwalker Ranch all the way through the UFO um, idea that we're seeing now. So it's just, it was really entertaining to watch what you did, but it was just great work. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm such a big fan of both of you, such a big fan of the show. Uh, it's really an honor to be on here. So thank you. We'll be in touch. And by the way, Chris, some point you get, need to go to an IRVA convention, right? The International yeah. Viewing Association. Those are a gas. So it's all yeah, I've, I've heard. <laughs> yeah, I've heard so many stories about those. And I, I do look forward to being there one day, hopefully. Yeah, great talking to you. Thanks. Yeah. Great talking to you, too. Thanks, guys. Cadence 13 Studios, available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.